welcome from the Diplomatic Academy yeah. in Vienna. It is my pleasure to welcome uh, you all here for our series Diplomacy, Your Question, Our Answers. Uh, and this is a, a premiere. We do it for the first time in cooperation uh, with uh, Costa Rica. Uh, and it's a pleasure to, to welcome uh, not only the ambassador of Costa Rica to Austria, but also high representatives from the foreign ministry uh, of Costa Rica here, and the director, my colleague of the Costa Rican Diplomatic Institute, Jorge Sainz Carbonelli. Uh, it's also a first of cooperation between our two diplomatic institutions, although there was a meeting already uh, in Chile in 2017, I think, when there was an the annual meeting of all the diplomatic institutes. Uh, I just allow me to give a, a little bit of the uh, of the technicalities of our meeting. Uh, after my my short welcome, I will ask uh, Jorge Science Cabonel for a short in introduction, and then we already go into the matter we want to discuss. Uh, and the title we gave to this uh, to this meeting is Integration in Central America and in Europe the cases of Costa Rica and Austria. I, I do know that this is not a topic for one hour, but we try to be as precise as possible. Uh, and maybe this is the start of a, of, a more, of a more intensive dialogue. The first presentation will come by uh, Johannes Merck about cooperation between the European Union and the uh, SICA, the Central American Integration System. And this will be followed by a presentation of Adriana Solana last year about Costa Rica and the Central American integration system towards sustainable uh, development. The closing remarks then will come by Alejandro Solano, as I mentioned, the ambassador uh, to Austria and the permanent representative of Costa Rica to the international organizations in Austria, as there are so many, a lot of work for the ambassador. Uh, and then I may say a few final words uh, as well. Uh, this event is live streamed uh, on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, and if you want to ask questions, you are most welcome. Please place your question or comment on the Facebook page during the streaming. And I will read out the questions uh, to our speakers. So, so much about technicalities. Uh, um, again, uh, let me say, uh, I think it's, it's a very good moment that we start such a discussion because it's obvious, not in our relations, but obvious that we have geopolitical disruptions all around us. Some of them are easy to recognize, some are more difficult to recognize. But um, one of those disruptions which is easy to recognize is that there's a challenge to multilateral cooperation. Uh, and as an answer to this challenge, uh, there is a feeling that regional cooperation uh, is a very good means uh, of working towards more multilateral world. Uh, even within the European Union, we have sort of micro regional corporations, which seem to make sense, uh, uh, even in, in, a, in, a, in a very special entity like the European Union. So we have to react to this. And, and I feel an, an exchange of minds between the cases of Central European integration, uh, sorry, Central American and European integration uh, does make sense. Uh, and this should also include to a certain extent our foreign policy priorities, whereas Costa Rica and where Austria look, which way they look, how important to them uh, the integration system is, whether there are changes that we can observe, uh, and whether some of these permanent issues, like for instance, the concept of neutrality, or fighting against the uh, fighting for disarmament, especially nuclear disarmament, however, these are constant priorities in spite of these geopolitical uh, disruptions uh, that we experience uh, all around us. But I'm here at the beginning only to say welcome, uh, because we have speakers uh, who will follow on all of these questions. Uh, so I would now ask Jorge Sáenz Carbonell, my colleague uh, from the Costa Rican Diplomatic Institute, Instituto del Servicio Exterior, Manuel Maria de Peralta, for his words of introduction. Thank you, Ambassador Briggs, and thanks uh, to everybody. Uh, for me, it's a great pleasure to, to uh, be here in this first encounter with the uh, 
Diplomatic Academy in Austria. And uh, anyway, for uh, we, we may ask why two countries so far away are, are talking, uh, making joint efforts. Well, we are not that uh, far away if we look at our uh, background. If you go to the Caribbean coast in Costa Rica, there is a river which is very popular uh, for rafting. And uh, in the middle of a tropical forest, there was once a, a little city called Austria in back in the 16th century. Uh, and why Austria? Because uh, we had uh, a common emperor, Charles V, and uh, we had uh, many Austrian kings from the family of Habsburg for many years in Costa Rica too, as, uh, we, who reign in Spain while their cousins reign in Vienna. But uh, we get together again in the 19th century in the legendary times of uh, Kaiser Franz Joseph and the Guten Kaiser. France in this Gluckenhesten glands. And we appoint our first uh, minister resident in, in Vienna in 1833, I think. And uh, it was the start of a diplomatic uh, link, which was not uh, quite close at the time. But now, if we see our countries now, and we are two small countries, we are two neutral countries, and then it is very important for us, the things that the Ambassador Briggs mentioned, we need multilateral organizations to be remarked as the main way to maintain peace and security in the world. And also the integration is a, essential for countries like ours, which need neighbors, which need friends which need brothers and i think that uh, costa rica and austria uh, had a good ground to be friends and to be brothers thank you thank you for for your words of introduction um i could also mention a lot of historical examples of our good relationship but i think now it's time to go to the the, the present challenges that we have uh, and that's what i would like to ask our our speakers uh, to uh, and our first speaker is Johannes Merck. He is an academic coordinator of the master program Diplomacy and International Relations, University of Applied Sciences, uh, Campus Vienna. And he is professional lecturer at our Diplomatische Akademie uh, here in Vienna, our Vienna School of International Studies. Uh, the title he gives to his, uh, to his talk is Multilevel Cooperation Between the European Union and the Central American integration system uh, seeker, uh, but I would invite him also to say a little bit about the challenges for future EU integration, uh, because we are at, at some sort of crossroads at the moment in the European integration, and this might be interesting for our friends in Costa Rica. Please, Professor Merck. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Briggs. Uh, thank you and welcome to all of you here in our panel on our panel. It's a big pleasure for me seeing so many uh, friends, people from Costa Rica. I have a very long-standing uh, tradition of working with academicians uh, from your country. We have published books. I have uh, given talks just a couple of weeks ago at the National uh, University of Costa Rica, obviously also by Zoom. Um, and uh, so I'm very happy uh, to talk a little bit about an issue. I think it's uh, crucial um, when we talk about uh, Central America. It is maybe one of the largest ex experiments and uh, the region with the largest experience also of intensive regional integration. Yeah, It starts basically out already with the independence from Spain. There is a lot of intentions and a lot of efforts uh, in the 19th century to integrate uh, Central America. Uh, it did not really work out. Uh, I will not go into the details, but uh, for me, there is one important data and I would like to highlight that uh, because it is an important issue until our days. And that is uh, the Central American Court of Justice in 1907, obviously invited by the United States and Mexico, uh, but uh, Costa Rica launches uh, this uh, very first 
permanent international tribunal uh, to the world. So for me, that is the very first uh, interesting um, contribution of Central America to the international relations of in general terms. You know, this idea that we have a judiciary system that goes beyond the sovereignty of uh, one state, as we all know in Europe, we have this, but we will take, for us, it will take until the 1950s uh, in order to establish a similar system. So that is for me a, a very first moment of this integration uh, process in Central America. Another very important one is inspired after the Second World War, and I will always highlight this to the students who are not from Latin America, um, the dependency theory idea of center and periphery, this idea that Costa Rica, like other Latin American countries, are in a peripheral situation uh, towards the centers. Uh, Central America has a lot of um, uh, not sometimes so nice, nice encounters with the United States. Uh, as a regional uh, superpower. And uh, this leads uh, to the idea uh, that uh, uh, we, we as uh, Latin Americans and as uh, Central Americans, we have to come together and we have to create uh, a sort of economic, economic integration. So that is for me the next uh, important step of Costa Rica and the contribution of Central America to the idea of uh, pulling together um, the um, economic forces of creating uh, a Central American common market. That's for me a second very important moment, uh, an innovation also, because out of the idea of import substitution industrialization, this idea we put together our economies, um, we protect up to a certain point our markets. I know this looks for students who are looking to us uh, in neoliberal times very strange, but that was a quite successful model during the 1950s, 60s, until the 1970s, some countries until the 1990s in all Latin America, but especially also in Central America. I, I think that was a, a very important next step, yeah, the common market and pulling together um, the, uh, uh, the efforts in order to substitute certain importations. Um, and then obviously the 1980s, um, during the Cold War with the special situation of Nicaragua and the Sandinistas, um, but uh, at the same time, uh, a visionary politician from your country um, in this regard, Arias, President Arias, uh, and pulling together, once again, this idea of integration uh, with the treaties of Ipulas one and two, uh, bringing integration into a peace process. That was for me another, I would even say innovative aspect of uh, Central American contributions uh, of the idea of um, integration. We all know the Europeans did something similar, similar with the coal and steel um, initiatives at the very beginning after the Second World War. Uh, Costa Rica and the other Central American countries um, pulled together did uh, 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 integration process together in order also to pull out external actors uh, from the region and say, well, we will try to get uh, on the ground an integration process by leading ourselves this process. So for me, this was another uh, uh, big step, uh, uh, a step where I have deep respect for uh, the diplomacy and the politicians uh, to pull together um, uh, this idea of integration in order to get a peace process. Yeah? Uh, this, this, I think, we, we, we also have uh, to recognize as one of these uh, really important steps when we talk about integration of Central uh, America. And obviously, um, out of all these initiatives in 91, the system which is now 30 years old, um, the uh, Central uh, American, the Sistema de la Integración Centroamericana, uh, SICA, which is uh, now uh, 30 years old. And uh, this is one of, I suppose, one of the reasons why we came together, um, um, where I think uh, this also is a very important uh, uh, mechanism because as I tried to say in my, um, in my title, yeah, it's a multi-level uh, integration. So you are not looking just 
at economic issues. You are looking very strongly at human rights issues. As you all know, 1907, what I said, the first international uh, tribunal of justice you will create, you have created uh, together with the organization of the American states, a uh, tribunal um, also for human rights, a court of justice for human rights that is based in, in Costa Rica, which I think is a major um, achievement. Also, interestingly enough, only the Latin American countries are there. The US is not there. There are reasons for that. And I just want to say that it's an organization uh, promoted by the uh, organization of American states, but the, the one of the uh, important actors is not there. That says a lot also about uh, commitments on a multinational level uh, uh, as uh, uh, Ambassador Briggs already mentioned. Um, so these, these elements, I think, are very important when we want to understand the integration process in Central, um, uh, Central America. And I would like to use the word innovation. Yeah? that Central America has in these respects, in these specific points, uh, really innovated and in giving some uh, lessons also to the world. Yeah? Beside obviously uh, something we have already mentioned, the abolition of the army and uh, the uh, reach out uh, precisely of Costa Rica uh, uh, in the human rights uh, fields. Um, so now uh, let's turn to the European Union and how the European Union is uh, here also integrated. We have to say the European Union is the most single important donor for many interact activities of uh, the integration process in Central America. So the Europeans um, have, I think, contributed not only with money, but also, uh, and I would like to quote, uh, some colleagues, um, uh, manners uh, on this issue. Uh, the most important factor shaping international role of the EU is not what it does, nor what it says, but what it is. This means an inspiring institution to follow. I think that is the part that the EU has uh, also played in uh, Central America. Um, it is an inspiring institution, and up to a certain point, the EU uh, was very reluctant to support your integration process. I think uh, I, I could now name the numbers. We don't have to look at the numbers, but it is a complete different approach of supporting the integration process. And here I would like to highlight one thing. I think in the previous talk uh, with uh, Ambassador Solano, we have already mentioned it. Uh, this element of the civil society as one of the key elements uh, of this uh, integration process, also of the SICA system. Um, there is this close connection between civil society, including academia, and the political system, yeah? which makes also the efforts on the side of the EU, when you look carefully, a lot of projects, a lot of money uh, went into this process of civil society organization support uh, on the side of the European Union, very contrary uh, of the support by USA, by the Americans who made much more emphasis in uh, issues of trade and of liberty, liberties in individ individual sense. So I uh, would like uh, also to highlight in this respect, the special relationship with uh, uh, the EU and the SICA uh, as, as, as a system. Uh, and obviously all the support SICA uh, uh, received uh, through uh, the different uh, channels of the European Union. I just want to mention one program, uh, the Bairka, the Bairka program, the program of support of Central American uh, regional integration, which was a major program precisely to uh, uh, follow and following up your integration process. Um, now I want to uh, leave my notes and I want to address an issue uh, that uh, Ambassador Briggs brought up. What means this integrational process also for Europe? Well, there is one obviously, a very obvious one um, that is up to a certain point. You know, I got a little bit inspired by um, 
concept uh, by Juan Bosch, um, an intellectual from the Dominican Republic who talks about la frontera imperial, the imperial border, which does not vanish after the empires collapsed. Yeah, so in the Caribbean, you have this very clearly. You have the uh, British uh, islands, uh, Jamaica, Barbados, you name them, what uh, is called nowadays also the University of West, West Indies or the West Indies cricket team. Uh, so that is uh, this idea that uh, borders uh, don't uh, necessarily vanish uh, just because the empire is not there anymore. So in this regard, here in Europe, yes, definitely Austria is in a special situation, as we all know with Central Europe. Um, I, I, I agree um, with you that we have to look at perspectives uh, beyond the European Union, that we look at local associations. I think here also uh, Central America serves a little bit as an example, because obviously you just have to look at the flags of Central American countries. Uh, you will see, obviously, a lot of commonalities. And uh, up to a certain point, also, uh, I would like to dare to say um, uh, maybe certain strategies um, in case CELAC, this means the overall system uh, comes again back, um, maybe will have an impact uh, in such a way that the Central Americans speak with one voice within a brighter, um, integrated Latin American system. I could imagine that, yeah? And something similar could happen yeah? uh, also in the European case, thinking of, about the uh, Frontera Imperial in the Austrian sense, we know that in Frontera Imperial, the Spanish uh, border, which uh, uh, obviously until our days, um, we can trace. There are reasons why Austrian companies are making investments in Eastern Europe uh, mainly and not necessarily in Spain and why Spanish uh, banks are present in Latin America but not necessarily present in Austria. Um, this uh, uh, obviously uh, could lead uh, to the idea that there is a regionalization within uh, larger supranational entities. Um, I think uh, that could be an interesting uh, topic of comparison uh, between what we could call uh, the Central European uh, initiatives, uh, the Central European uh, uh, forms also of integration, and the Central uh, American uh, experience. But, and now with this I conclude, but, in this case, it's like in Latin America. These things are happening basically always if you have the political leadership who is interested in this integration process or not. In, in, in Latin America, we call this diplomacia presidencial. This means a lot of issues are linked uh, with the presidents in power. Yeah? You can see sometimes uh, the heydays of integrational projects in Latin America due to the fact that there are several presidents interested in a further and a deeper cooperation. And if there is a president not interested at all, or even is not, re is not uh, is reluctant to give up certain forms of sovereignty, then immediately he retracts and you have the whole process again down. Yeah? Best example right now is Bolsonaro and, and, and the CELAC system. Um, uh, which Brazil basically suspended the membership. It's in suspension. We don't know what will happen after him. Uh, but that also is something, obviously, you have to take into consideration in our region. Yeah, we all know this. We have also outspoken presidents around our neighborhood, and they have their own agenda sometimes. So uh, that is the, <laughs> the other side of the coin when you want to have these uh, more regional um, integration processes, um, uh, which uh, maybe go beyond, go beyond the already established um, institutional ways, like the European Union, no matter who is in power, at the end of the day, there are certain uh, procedures everybody has to follow. Yeah? 
So I just give this as a, as a small hint um, because this is an issue I always have to tackle as a diplomatic academy when it comes to students asking me uh, about the integration process in Latin America. Um, I would like, it, would like to finish here, stop here, and I'm uh, happy to take questions or engage in a discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Merck. Uh, not only for what you said about the Latin American uh, process, but also about the European process. Uh, and I think for our friends uh, in Central America, uh, it may sound a bit strange, uh, but I fully agree that although when you look at our European institutions, they are very strong. So we have this sort of institutionalized normality, which is running whoever is the leader. Uh, we lately experience uh, that uh, integration is not a one way ticket only. So that we have examples from membership for member countries who feel that sovereignty and national decision making partly also in the COVID-19 crisis is more important than the integration process. Uh, and the reason for this, and maybe there, there is a connection, Professor Merck, also to Central America. The reason for this is that we support civil society organizations around the globe, including Central America, but we hardly do anything within the European Union itself. We do not support civil society organizations in the member countries of the, of the European Union. We just expect that, that they are there and thrive without any a special political impulse. Uh, and we realized lately that we have to mobilize people and voters for the European Union again. That's why we started, uh, and that may be interesting for you also, a conference on the future of Europe. We should include as many citizens as possible, a process which runs for one year until the French presidency. Uh, and we have to do this because uh, as, you, as our friends know, we have European elections regularly for the European Parliament. Uh, and in some member countries, uh, we have about 15% participation only uh, in, this, in, in these elections. And, and this is in a democracy, uh, uh, not something that is sustainable. So we really have to work on it. There are big differences because we are on the integration path much deeper than you are in Central America. But maybe this is helpful to, to also mention out the facts that we have that we have in, on the European side. And I thank you also for speaking about leadership issues, uh, which I think will, is a growing concern also in, the, in, in our uh, European context. Uh, and the imperial borders, that is something that's uh, we can feel uh, uh, in, in all parts of, of the European integration. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, Austria uh, has quite a specific role uh, in all of this. But here I stop because I'm only moderating. Uh, and I give the, the word really uh, to Adriana Solano Lassia. She's Director General of the Foreign Policy Directorate in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and Worship of Costa Rica. And the title of her lecture is Costa Rica and the Central American Integration System Towards Sustainable Development. And congratulations to the presidency. Congratulations to the presidency of SICA for Costa Rica uh, this year. And congratulations to 100 years of independence. There are many things to congratulate you on. But I guess you will also speak about the challenges. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Director. Well, first of all, um, I would like to say hello to our colleagues, ambassadors, diplomats, and friends. Guten Tag. We uh, are here in the Casa Marina, which is also the, the building of uh, the first Court of Justice in Central America. Now, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Costa Rica. We call it Casa Marina, the Yellow House. Well, actually, I'm very pleased uh, to participate in this academic event. I am a convinced believer that um, the academia plays a unique role in bringing people together by letting them know a little bit each other, a little bit more, and offers a space to raise uh, ideas of different perspectives. And most of all, creates the opportunity to raise uh, and build uh, solutions to build together better perspectives for the, our future in a constructive way. This is why I feel honored and grateful for sharing this platform 
with the Honorable Professor and Director of the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna. And I really thank you for this opportunity. While we were thinking about the subject of, to this dialogue, we discussed with Ambassador Solano, not me, the other Ambassador Solano, which is in Vienna, Alejandro Solano, to whom I say hello. Uh, we we in, uh, exchanged different ideas on which kind of discussion we could have. And as a Director Briggs said, we could spend the whole day sharing ideas and, and experiences about these two integration processes. And um, we agreed that it could be of interest to you all to understand our relationship towards our own region, the Central American region, by sharing you our own principles and values regarding sustainable and human development. Today is actually a very symbolic day because Costa Rica, as you may know, will be ending today its contemporary presidency of the Central American Integration System, the so-called SICA. Today, we will have our last meeting, indeed, as PDP. For those that are not yet familiar with our integration system, SICA is to Costa Rica what the European Union is to Austria, more or less. This year, 2021, marks four special celebrations in our region. It marks the 30th anniversary of the creation of SICA. We have then, I was saying, that we will have four celebrations. The first of all, the 30th anniversary of the creation of SICA. We have the 35th anniversary of the Esquipulas process, which is the peace process in our region, 86, 87. We celebrate our 200 years of independence. Now that we are discussing these um, imperial borders, <laughs> 200 years of independence of seven of its members and 40 years of independence of Belize. And we celebrate this year as well 150 years of diplomatic relations between Austria and Costa Rica. So this is a very, very special year. And I think uh, um, we have to be uh, very um, happy in, in the opportunity to build together another 200 years together. Our integration system, as Professor Johannes was telling us, is one of the oldest in the world, works by consensus, and has no supranationality, unlike the European Union. I think it is important to, to take in, in mind. Article 3 of the agreement of SICA, the Protocol of Tegucigalpa, which is the main agreement for the creation of SICA, has a fundamental objective and says that the integration has a purpose to build a region of peace, liberty, democracy, and development. We are now eight members, Belize, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Panama, and República Dominicana, Dominican Republic. Altogether, we are more than 57 million people. We are rich in biodiversity and cultural heritage, one of the highest rates in the world, for instance. We don't have a young population, and of course, still different levels of development. Life expectancy, just to give you an idea, ranges from 70 years old, 75 years old up to 80, for instance, in Costa Rica. During the pandemic, that has put everything upside down in an exacerbated pre-existing vulnerabilities in our region and in the center, uh, in, a, in our region and our country as well, we have noticed again how important is the role of international community due to our interdependence. Costa Rica, as a country of without army, no army, is very important has always supported political dialogue and as a preventive diplomacy to guarantee peace and security. It has always recognized the role of international and regional institutions to foster our goals for peace and development. When we started our presidency of SICA in January this year, 
The most important task we faced was to raise actions to tackle the, those common challenges in the region, not only in the, in the light of the pandemic, but also related to pre-existing ones, such as the need to promote human rights, democracy, and good governance. As within the European Union, in our region, we focused our agenda around four pillars that happen to be very accurate, I have to say, because for the first time, I would say, if the other countries are here uh, in, 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 in the digital space, they will also say the same. All countries were in the same track on the needs and expectations because of COVID pandemic and its consequences. Because we work on the basis of consensus, sometimes decision making, making poses a lot of backlashes. And in the region, we actually face similar situations regarding high levels of public debt, fiscal burdens, and we were hit economically and socially by the pandemic. Like Costa Rica, the other SICA countries have also experienced a shutdown in their respective tourism sector, just to name one of the sectors that are crucial for our economies. In Costa Rica, to give you an idea, tourism accounts for 27% of its GDP. Altogether, we have recognized jointly that we need, we need to close in those structural gaps and growing threats that we have in the region, such as poverty, exclusion and inequality. We are experiencing threats against democratic institutions, the growing vulnerability to climate change and loss of biodiversity, as well as corruption and criminality. Hurricanes such as Yota and Eta are two of the main extreme events that hampers our development recently. This is why, as a PDP, we focused our efforts to pursue a prompt economic and social recovery. But conceiving our future development also in a, in, a, in, a, in a new way, but we call building back better. That is promoting the concept of the need for a sustainable, green, and inclusive recovery. Of course, using technological and digital transformation. Our PTP also sought to develop actions aimed at strengthening the health of the population, providing access to medicines and supplies, of, of course, vaccines to serve the population during and after the pandemic. It also advanced the issue of mental health, food and nutritional security, crucial areas to foster health, healthier societies. In the same way, we have promoted attention to the most vulnerable people and populations. We focus in mainly in migrants and displaced people to open for them new pathways and opportunities for economic and social well-being again. Finally, we have focused on promoting science, technology, creativity, and innovation, as Professor also mentioned, with particular emphasis on comprehensive risk management and the fight against climate change. During the pandemic, though, we managed to move together and to call for international support in a smooth, collaborative, and prompt way. This is why we used our PDP to open, to open in dialogue channels with other countries beyond our region, to provide a way to share best practices and to promote closer collaboration and cooperation that could be beneficial for the region as a whole. And we don't do it alone. During the pandemic, we were thrilled to see how the relationship between uh, actors that we were built for many years, like with Austria, based precisely upon shared values and principles regarding the rule of law, the respect for human rights, and the sustainable development, allowed us, Costa Rica, to work together with those reliable partners in those difficult times. Therefore, from the PDP, Costa Rica enhanced political dialogue between the region and extra-regional extra partners, countries, and international organizations such as the IOM, the UNHCR, FAO, OES, among others. I would like to stress the solidarity and the cooperation between Austria and Costa Rica in these special times, honoring our 150 years of diplomatic relations. Actually, we have managed to go together Austria and Costa Rica 
in the international arena to put forward common initiatives in the field, for example, of humanitarian assistance, also nuclear disarmament. Our two countries have taken part in so-called smart work, a space that allowed exchange of good practices, concerns and issues to combat COVID-19 and pandemic among countries that have effectively or well, more or less, managed the pandemic and its effects on the society. Recently, Costa Rica has been recognized by Federal Chancellor Sebastian Kurz as one of the two Latin American countries with strategic partnership. Within this framework, initiatives are already underway to strengthen actors of good practices, actions of good practices in matters such as protection of national parks, in which Costa Rica has a strong expertise. We also work in, in the field of digitalization, which is crucial for the future and also for the region as a whole, environment, environment and climate change. We have shared interest in initiatives related to management of protected areas, cybersecurity, and so forth. Tomorrow, as an example, Costa Rica, Costa Rica we will take part in the Austrian World Summit on Climate Initiatives. We believe these actions with Austria and other European partners have allowed us to demonstrate the potentiality of the contributions of middle-income countries like ours in bringing ideas and best practices to solve common and shared goals with countries with affinities. In this context, Austria has been playing a key role in creating new bridges with Costa Rica. And because of our interdependence with our Central American region, has set out the basis to open new windows of collaborative opportunities with our Central American and Caribbean counterparts. As for Austria to, Austria to the European Union, Costa Rica has a strong partnership with Central American colleagues. Our regional integration structure, based on the rule of consensus, led us to reach our strategic partnership with the European Union and its member states. The association agreement signed between our two regions, one of its kinds, but 10 years ago now, we have other uh, agreements also going on, was conceived as a base to foster shared interests in values, mainly democracy, the rule of law, sustainable development, and human rights. The association agreement relies on three complementary and equally important pillars, namely political dialogue, which for Costa Rica is crucial, cooperation and trade, which reinforce each other and their effects. These are the right tools to support economic growth, democracy and political stability in Central America. The trade pillar, as you know, has been provisionally applied since 2013. We now expect the association agreement to enter into force as a whole very soon in its three pillars. There is just one country left, an European country, to ratify the agreement to take in force. This agreement also provides three essential elements that are important to our endeavors. Article 4 sets an obligation to respect the rule of law human rights, and the non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. To, re to breach the breach of these commitments will constitute a material infringement of the agreement. The nature of the association agreement is in line with of the shared values we have with Austria and the European Union. And as Professor was saying, the inspiration comes also not just by inspiration, but also by sharing common values. And I think that this is why we have to um, stress that the, the values and the principles that guide our vision and development are important to our um, collaborative approach. In SICA, and it was mentioned as well, we have also the economic integration uh, CIECA, which is uh, was established, is also a, a sub um, system within the SICA system, and uh, was uh, set in, in 1960, and is responsible for ensuring the correct application of the legal instruments for the regional economic integration, promotes economic and sustainable development, and 
has uh, the idea of putting in place the economic union of certain countries in, in the region. We are aware that we have many challenges ahead of us, and we believe this year, 2021, requires us to think about the future, the next 200 years for development and independent life. Costa Rica firmly believes and considers essential to move towards a green and innovative partnership with the European Union and member states, strengthening the strategic partnership in sustainable and dynamic ambition. The entry into force of the association agreement could give an additional impetus to the roadmap and engagement of the two integration platforms for collaboration and better recovery and inclusiveness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director General, for giving us this overview, but also for giving us quite concrete examples of where it's good to collaborate, how you can collaborate, and what are the preconditions. Uh, and, and I appreciate uh, you, what you said about the association agreement with the European Union. I understand this is important. Uh, and uh, uh, you know that within the European Union, we very often have strong lobbying interests on issues like this, which are hard to overcome. I'm very frank here. So it's uh, sometimes uh, it's our, our farmers, sometimes it's, it's industry, sometimes it's, it's of the financial sector. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult to, to, uh, to overcome these sort of lobbying interests, uh, especially because uh, in, on these fundamental issues, we also have a consensus principle, as you have. We have this, we call it unanimity principle uh, for many of the, of the, of the big issues. Uh, and at the moment, we're discussing in the European Union whether for parts of a future uh, development of innovation of our structures, we should do away with parts of the unanimity principle, of the consensus principle. But this is, as you know from your perspective, also problematic because if you don't have consensus, then some of the partners may feel they are left out and may even leave the integration project. So there is the fear if we, for instance, in our common foreign security policy, we change from unanimity uh, to majority, uh, quality majority, then countries may think about leaving the European Union. So this is not out of the question, so it's difficult. But I do understand that the association agreement uh, it, it would be uh, is very important and, and it is something that we should really uh, follow uh, you i'm also thankful that you mentioned the differences because sika uh, uh, is not a supranational uh, organization whereas we in the european union uh, are still i would say are still a supranational organization we also have tendencies uh, towards renationalization, which also has to do with leadership. We also discussed, we already discussed it a, a, a little bit, so we do understand where the problems are. Uh, there are two issues, uh, Madam Director General, if I may, I would like to follow up or, or ask you. Uh, one is, you mentioned tourism. Uh, tourism is for your whole the whole region of Central America very important and I've been a tourist to the Dominican Republic once I know how important it is for the Dominican Republic to have tourists and you spoke about 27 percent of GDP coming from tourism uh, and as an Austrian we have a similar situation not 27 percent but we have between 10 and 15 percent coming from tourism. And in these years of, of, of the COVID-19 crisis, this uh, uh, is a special problem. Um, we had to react first on a national level to support our tourism industry uh, with a lot of public money. Uh, so I would say that the majority of our financial support by the government went first of all into what we call Kurzarbeit, so, so restricted work, shortened work for in industry and in other parts, and partly in, in supporting our hotels, our, 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 our gastronomy, and, and our tourism. Um, uh, and uh, we realized that this sort of crisis for tourism immediately turns into a problem with your neighbors. Do you have similar experiences uh, that in, in this case of crisis, 
uh, you could not really co collaborate with your neighbors on how to overcome the problems uh, for the tourism uh, in the region. Uh, and secondly, my question concerns, which is maybe even more difficult, the issue of migration. Uh, I know at the beginning of the epidemic, uh, you declared something like a common secure area or region, but it didn't really work out in the end. Uh, and we have a similar experience. We, we didn't even try to have a common secure area. We immediately fell back on our national borders, even between close neighbors like Italy and Austria. And it created neighborly problems also with, between Germany and Austria. Do you have similar experiences because your situation is even more difficult at the moment regarding migration issues than it is in, in, our, in our case and you have this big neighbor on your north who, who always changes his policy on migration uh, and you have no influence, not, not much influence uh, on what this big neighbor is doing. Would you, would you like to, to answer to, to this, these questions? Yes, of course. And I, well, we we certainly agree that um, there are certain sectors like tourism that uh, were very um, were hit strongly, and that's why we. What, one of the main ideas I would like to stress for for the people that are with us today is that um, in these pandemic times, so pandemic uh, uh, crisis we have, regional integration seems to be the best possibility to foster common activities in order to raise the hand in the international world to say, look, we are here, we need help, and we need also support. And we can also share our own best practices in return. Mm, we, for example, in, in, in this uh, semester as PDP, we managed to have a, a, a strong event related to migrants and displaced people. We were accompanied by several European partners, also American, Latin American partners, Asian partners, in also to see and focus the needs of the migration flows coming through Central America, departing from Central America, and also going to North, but coming from Near Europe or, or Africa, or because all those are uh, mixed uh, refu refugee and also migration flows. And uh, sometimes we think of certain challenges as a local challenges, while, while instead they're um, the source of those uh, challenges or problems comes also in the interdependence and, and also the interrelation with other regions in the world. And I think uh, in our efforts, joint efforts as a region was very strong in order to put that on the table. Uh, the same happened with the uh, access or the call to equal access to vaccines. Because we were together and because, because we raised our voice together, we were managed to put our attention to our region. Because we know that the pandemic and the access to vaccines are not a, a Central American issue. It's a worldwide issue. So how to present ourselves in a unified form in order to, to capture this attention to our region? And I think the vision integration allowed us also to, 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 to put that on the table. And then when I, I, I could speak about all the plans and also the policies that were taking uh, place uh, during the last year in the different sectorial committees we have in the SICA region, in health, in tourism, because even protocols, uh, regional protocols were uh, discussed, uh, uh, for instance, to, to tackle the problem in, in the tourism sector. We had also in the aviation, because all the borders and also the aviation landscape was, was uh, also closed, so how to deal with that? And uh, we managed to have conversations among our authorities, regional authorities. Uh, how to support families that are most vulnerable during the crisis by giving also food and, 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 and putting in place a, a, a food security plan. So I, I, I believe that um, even though we are very, um, how do I say, um, 
very reluctant to give supranationality because in that thing, I, I believe that we are not ready to, to go beyond. We rely also in these regional efforts to go and move forward, even for those um, critic issues that also uh, uh, are, are on the table as well. That could be democratic government, uh, uh, governance, uh, corruption, uh, drugs, fighting drugs trafficking. So those are very sensitive issues. And, and perhaps the regional integration doesn't solve the things, but at least gives a channel for discussion, sometimes consultation, and, 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 and the political dialogue. This is what Costa Rica depends and try to put forward for the features ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Professor Mark, would you like to comment on the on the talk of of uh, Director General Solano? Yes, um, actually, the last uh, topic I think about migration deserves uh, certain attention uh, because at the end um, we have in front of us a situation which is divided in Central America. Costa Rica is not really expulsing; is not sending people. To the United States, the problem obviously are the other Latin Amer uh, Central American countries. Um, we have a very similar situation like um, here in Europe with a buffer state called Mexico. We have a buffer state called Turkey, and we have a buffer state called Morocco. And uh, all these, uh, the function of these buffer states is up to a certain point uh, to prevent uh, for the global north. Uh, that Global South uh, influx is coming uh, into uh, the Global North. So we are here obviously exactly discussing issues. Uh, Ambassador or uh, Adriana uh, Solana already mentioned. Uh, this is about good governance. This is about making homework uh, in these countries. Uh, otherwise uh, you lose your population. Um, the very, clear uh, issue is you have uh, a lot of violence, drug problems in uh, several Central American countries and uh, people uh, flee from this situation. Uh, so I also agree on the uh, initiatives coming from sometimes also from Mexico, um, uh, trying to uh, yeah, uh, develop and give uh, more attention to development in Central America. Here, I'm not necessarily talking about Costa Rica, I'm talking about the other Latin America, uh, Central American countries. Um, but yes, I think as Central Americans, I'm obviously not the, in the position of giving advices here, um, but I uh, suggest following the old tradition of overcoming civil war situations you had in the past, you mentioned Esquipula 1, Esquipulas 1, 2, uh, the agreements of Tegucigalpa, um, the Contadora group in the past. Um, you have to find a, a, a regional solution uh, to your economic and social problems. Yeah? And this cannot come, at the end, this cannot come from the European Union, this cannot come from the United States. Um, I think there, you have to rely on a certain tradition, as I try to uh, point out, um, when you try to solve a very international conflict. Uh, at the time, as you know, there were involved the Iran Contra -gate, uh, gate, you remember, uh, you had a, a real international uh, actors uh, in the region trying to intermingle and try to uh, uh, put a lot of fingers in your internal affairs. And I think here there is really a need, uh, obviously it's not easy, but going uh, to this, uh, I would say, uh, good passes of the past uh, of common uh, cooperation and, um, and, 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 and looking at these issues. I mean, the same applies and goes obviously also for the European Union uh, with uh, Africa, um, with all the countries where we have the influx, Afghanistan, uh, we have a, a similar, uh, and similar issue. And uh, this is, uh, you see, not a very academic advice, uh, more uh, a policy 
a policy uh, advice or uh, yeah, do your homework. This, this is what I would like to say, and not necessarily in this case to Costa Rica. Uh, but yes, you have an influence. You are from the region, you speak the same language, and you, you know your neighbors, so you have to extend certain influence on them. And I mean, then we start talking about Gini indexes. We talk about the disequality in Latin America when you have the, one of the highest uh, unequal societies in this planet. I mean, then you were discussing issues that go beyond this, but I, I will not, I will not uh, go into this field right now. Uh, yes, Professor Merck, you, uh, now you have been very critical of, of the situation. Uh, I, I have to admit in the European Union, uh, we did not succeed so far into a common asylum and migration policy. That's true. We are a supranational entity uh, and we know how big the problem is and still we, we cannot manage it. It is still something which the sovereign na nation states want to keep. Um, the Commission in the European Union is not even ready to now to deliver a, a proposal for a so-called migration uh, compact, as you know. It was promised, actually, the Commission are responsible for that, went to the Diplomatic Academy in Vienna more than one and a half years ago, gave a talk here and said, in the next few weeks, I will present the migration compact of the European Union. And we don't have it yet, as you know. And it will not come in the next months. So I just want to say <laughs> we shouldn't be too critical about others if we do not manage such a problem. Yeah, I agree with you. Obviously, you're completely right. Um, and once again, just what you said goes in the direction I wanted also to address to the Costa Rica, uh, to the Central American kids. This only works when you cooperate and you you agree on certain uh, common rules and bases and. Uh, I fully agree with you. I mean, this is a complete disaster. Uh, the whole asylum system right now we have in Europe. Actually, it's not a system at all. It's, as you said, uh, basically individual uh, legislations of individual states. And uh, obviously, uh, this will not uh, lead us to a solution. Yes, I, I, I fully agree with you. And it's our job, I think, in academia uh, to reflect on this and to uh, point out uh, these these problems. That's the function of our academic institutions, I think, uh, and, and and I agree with you fully. Uh, we have a few colleagues. I understand also on Zoom with us. Is there someone who wants to make a comment or ask a question? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to stress out that um, the. Um, the international cooperation and solidarity is also uh, crucial for those changes in our region. I, I believe that the region, it's a small region, you have to, to see. Right? Yeah. We are 57 million people all together, well, more or less. And, um, but we strive to, to, to look for good experiences and also uh, sharing best practices to avoid perhaps not making the same mistakes or trying to open the opportunity to, to improve also our own policies that are taking place. I think one of the main um, spirits of uh, regional integration is also to take into account the asymmetries between the, the, the countries and, and to help each other and also to, to I mean, to, to, to establish a strategy of joint collaboration. Uh, in, in Spanish, we say, sumar hace la fuerza. Okay? So I, I believe that uh, if we, we regard, uh, I mean, if we see at the, at the, the sectors or the, the, the fields for, for, I mean, the fields where we could have a consensus in working together, we should do it, you know? Sometimes um, we focus mainly on, on, on the differences, but also by building little by little the, the confidence and trust 
uh, by concrete actions that opens dialogue for the other things that are not that happy. You know, so I, I, I believe that this is the strength of our regional integration, and I think regional integration is all over the world because if you see other regional platforms, ASEAN, uh, Mercosur, the, all we, all of them, even European Union, I, I would say, you have different speeds between your own region platforms, and, and you have also your, your differences of perspectives and also your problems. But you have also the opportunities, and I think, uh, I mean, to go individually by in the world uh, as a country is very easy. But now in the globalized world, the inter inter interdependence also between the countries, the 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 exchanges. For example, Costa Rica has a, a very open open economy. Uh, we have many uh, free trade agreements. And that makes us a very open economy towards the world. So if the world doesn't go good, well, our economy doesn't go good, you know? So I, I believe that this inter interdependence also uh, bring us to the table to speak about common challenges and also to speak about possible common solutions. And, and this is the strength of the multilateral arena, the regional organizations, and also the relationship with close and good friends such as Austria and for Costa Rica, our relationship in our diplomatic relations. And I, I believe that this is important also, I, I would say, or I may say, that the political action is not, a, is not the same as diplomatic action. Sometimes diplomacy has to, to, to open dialogue where you are not required to have a dialogue uh, because uh, diplomacy and the ministries of foreign affairs they have a very very strong task in opening dialogue for solutions and and i believe uh, to to have this collaborative approach with reliable partners that helps us also in in bringing solutions to the table when the crisis or the situations are not that happy as for example, the pandemic, uh, just to, to, to mention one of them. Yes, no, I can fully agree. I've also from the Austrian side, uh, we rely on diplomacy uh, in our way. This is important. We have a common interest to rely uh, on the effective diplomacy. Our foreign minister speaks now about the effective multilateral diplomacy. And I think that is good. That includes looking for those countries which have a similar interest. Uh, and there, Costa Rica and, and, and Austria are, are obvious choices, uh, and many other countries. So I, I, I very much appreciate that you will participate in the, in the World Summit, Climate World Summit, uh, uh, because especially the issue of environmental change uh, is, 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 is an excellent example of where it makes sense. Uh, to look for partners there. Uh, sometimes, uh, even in really difficult situations, like the relations between the European Union and Russia, uh, when we look for common ground, in diplomatic common ground, then it is, again, it's already now clear it's the climate change, it's hopefully cybersecurity, and it's the fight against terrorism there, we try really through diplomatic channels, even if the situation is very difficult to work together. So I think all the more it's obvious uh, that we, we work with countries of a similar outlook on, on the global order uh, than, than the two of us that, that we work there. Uh, and I always have the feeling that we in the European Union have a lot of experience with our big neighbors namely Russia. And one could also say we should exchange our experience with a big neighbor with your experience in the Sika countries with a big neighbor, namely the United States. That would make possibly even sense also for our academic collaboration uh, to look into uh, how, how we politically, economically, culturally, we deal with this situation. Uh, but this is something for Professor Merck and his colleagues to do, actually. 
Yes, I, I agree with you. These comparative uh, research, um, I, I think, is a very important tool in order to understand better uh, a given situation. I, 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 I really could support this. Maybe we find some ways of collaborating. Um, I feel myself in the diplomatic academy as the uh, person who reaches out to Latin America. I'm always very happy when I have uh, Latin American students in my classroom. And so obviously we're happy uh, to see if we can explore some um, common uh, forms of collaboration, of course. I think that would make sense, and, and uh, we have a, a, a huge research program uh, about to begin in the European Union, the Horizon Europe program, uh, which is about uh, 190, it's 95 billion euro, uh, and, and uh, part of that will be devoted to the issue, how does the European Union work? with the outside world, with partners. Yeah. Uh, we in the European Union used to also politically th think mainly about the inside of the Union. Uh, and now so somehow we realized that in the new global order, it makes sense to invest into the looking to the outside. I'm very, I'm very rough here in my description, but this is the feeling also uh, in the European institutions that there is a change in our way of integration, that we look more to the outside than we did before. Sometimes it's simply called, we will use the power, uh, the language of power. I'm not so sure about this, but it means that we are looking more for a common language on issues uh, so that we don't leave uh, the language to, or the narrative to the Americans only, or to the Chinese or to the Russians. And, and I don't know. Yes, please, Ambassador Solano. Just one idea uh, hearing to you right now. Uh, I, I believe that the sharing experiences are also important. And I myself, I, I, I spent many years in, in Brussels, one in Belgium, because I, I did my, my uh, master's degree in, in Louvaneu. And, and um, I was in, in contact with another uh, language, like uh, Dutch, for instance. And uh, we have also German because of the border. With the, uh, I mean, Belgium is a melting pot of, of cultures. And uh, I believe that one of the main uh, um, fields for, for this um, new, innovative, constructive way of, of uh, promoting knowledge, mutual knowledge, is also by promoting the exchange of students, uh, internships, and also a worksheet, a, a workshops. Um, but in, 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 in creating these sharing experiences in, in the field. Um, I, I believe the European Union has uh, taken this into account a lot for many years. Actually, I, I was happy to be with all these um, Erasmus students in the time. And uh, I know we have now uh, we, a, a window, uh, Latin American Erasmus window, for instance, because precisely, the experience in the field by with other people thinking differently, uh, having different culture, brings us to the table with a, a better tools for dialogue. So I, I, I would say because you have this academia, it's a wonderful academia. I always um, read uh, your your research uh, articles and, and studies, and I I feel like um, perhaps. We can, and I give it that to our ambassador, the director of our um, a diplomatic uh, institute here in Costa Rica, ambassador for the science, to promote also this exchange of professors and also students between our two um, academic diplomacy institutes that we have. So I just leave it there on the table because I really feel that it's very important the human perspective in this mutual knowledge. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. I think this would make very much sense. Uh, and I understand that uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Director Carbonell, would like to add something on this. Thank you very much. 
Uh, really, well, I, I, first of all, I want to thank you uh, both uh, Professor Merckx and Ambassador Solano Laclay for their expositions. And uh, I think that uh, uh, we should keep trying to uh, find uh, areas of grounds of common work. We don't have much budget uh, uh, to, to make big things, but I think that there, there is uh, a lot of good goodwill and uh, desire of, of getting together as much as possible. I think that the virtual uh, activities are a, a very good way to, to uh, get closer. And I, I think that uh, we should keep uh, in, in this uh, effort going uh, as far as we could. As we could. And I think that uh, with the enthusiasm of Ambassador Solano and uh, the cooperation of Ambassador Briggs, I think we can really try to, to, to find, I think this first one has been a, a, an excellent opportunity. We have learned a lot. Uh, uh, not, not always we, we get the uh, inner European per per perspective of how the union uh, works or not works, which happens to us also. And uh, I think that this has been a very, very interesting for, for us. And, and I hope that also for the students and people which is, who are uh, listening to, to us or looking at uh, this presentation. And especially I want to, to thank uh, the uh, Embassy of Costa Rica in, in, in Vienna, not only the ambassador, but, but the, the collaborators, who, who, Alina and others who had made uh, this activity not only possible, but successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I was, I was just a, a little remark that I have uh, shared with my colleague uh, from Austria that our institute uh, uh, has the name of Manuel Maria de Peralta, who was, uh, he was uh, the main diplomat in, in Costa Rican history, but he also held, he also inherited the title of Markgraf von Peralta which was not German, which was not a Spaniard, but uh, it was given to one of his ancestors by an Austrian emperor, uh, Charles the sec the sixth, the, the father of Maria Teresa. So we have uh, still some links that comes and goes, and we should uh, keep uh, trying not to find them, but to build new ones. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Actually, I'm sitting here uh, in the complex of buildings where Maria Theresia used to live and her father died not far from here in one of the, of the, of the rooms here in the center of Vienna. So, so there is a, there's a, there's a, a room to discuss, actually. I, I'm very happy that, that, that we, we started this dialogue. Uh, and uh, I think for the closing remarks, it's Ambassador Solano now, because he will have a lot of work to follow up on this, uh, 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 this first meeting. I give the floor to Alejandro Solano, please. Thank you, Ambassador Briggs, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Mesca, uh, Michael, and Ambassador Science, uh, Ambassador Solano, for this very fruitful presentation, uh, certainly, being this one, our first activity we organized within the scope of our 150th anniversary. But it's not the first that we have scheduled for this second semester. Unfortunately, the lockdown that we have had during the last uh, months has uh, avoided us to organize uh, another activities. But I think this is a very uh, concrete activity that uh, allow as a country uh, with common interest to identify very productive areas of, of work. Certainly during the last years, as a part of my activity, we have been in common action with Austria in different areas. Not uh, so far tomorrow during the Austrian summit and climate change organized by President van der Bellen and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, the special speaker, one of the special guests is our President Carlos Alvarado. So he will deliver one statement tomorrow, this uh, event. And traditionally during the last three years, uh, our president has participated in, in this event. Uh, just uh, when the pandemic started, you remember the so-called smart countries committed by uh, Chancellor Kurz, those countries that uh, had managed the first uh, wave of the pandemic uh, was uh, Costa Rica, the only Latin American country that become part of this exclusive group. 
Uh, well, we are in the process to try to reinforce our diplomatic ties, and not only in the scope of this 150th anniversary, but in, in order to foster the next 150 years of our diplomatic ties. So certainly we are very glad that and this activity has been very successful in terms of all the information sharing. I'm confident that this dialogue can continue in the future. As Ambassador Sainz said, uh, we are, uh, uh, Ambassador Fix knows very well, we have met a couple of times to discuss this issue and how we can continue uh, fostering these uh, common areas of interest through the work of our diplomatic academies. So we will continue certainly in exploring ways because uh, I think we have a lot of room to discuss in, in this matter. Thank you very much for the time, Ambassador Briggs. I think I'm very glad that uh, having this uh, conversation today. We have a lot of words and a lot of questions and, and for ourselves in order to continue the discussion in a different uh, fora in the forthcoming days. Thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to see you. Uh, so I, I so I understand the final word lies with me uh, as a moderator. <laughs> I'm also saying thank you to all of you, uh, and I'm saying that it's actually uh, we are opening up, uh, and this is also a real opening up. Uh, we start now life after the pandemic, and I hope that is true for all all of us, not only uh, here in Austria but also uh, for your region, uh, and this includes partly hoping that we can come back to a normal. But I always say to my students also, let's go for a better normal, not for the old normal. Let's make some use of it. And part of it is that we can start dialogues like this now on the internet without any problems. That is an advantage after all, that we can do this. Uh, and I'm not sure to all of you whether we would have met uh, I would have loved to do it in Vienna or in, uh, in San Juan. If it would not be because of the situation we have now, we can do this. But as I said, we should meet in Vienna or in your lovely country to continue the dialogue. I'm open for the ambassador and for his proposals to work together. Uh, we have a platform here in Vienna, which is actually always open for international dialogue. Uh, and we are regularly doing this. Uh, so whenever you feel your president or any other of your politicians who needs a room for a presentation in Austria, we can do this. We had last week the new president of Kosovo speaking here and also the, the Europe minister of France speaking here. Uh, so we are a regular platform for, uh, for let's call it traveling statesman. Uh, and if there is an interest from your side, please let me know. But I end with the advertisement here and I say thank you. I, I really liked that we had the chance to meet and, and wish you all the best and we should continue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you from Costa Rica.